Hello and welcome to Frankly Speaking, where we dive deep into regional headlines. I speak with leading policymakers and business leaders. I am Katie Jensen. US and Saudi relations are once again in the spotlight following Secretary of State Anthony Blinken's recent visit to the kingdom. On this episode of Frankly Speaking, we are joined by Fahad Nazar, spokesperson for the Saudi Embassy in Washington, D.C., to ask whether the Saudi-U.S. relationship is back on track. Plus, is the Saudi-Iran deal a slap in the face to Washington, or can it serve their interests? And are the two sides any closer to securing a lasting ceasefire in Sudan? Mr. Nazar, thank you for joining us once again on our program. Now, it has been a hectic few months for Saudi-U.S. relations. Secretary Blinken has just concluded a very busy visit to the kingdom. There's been the anti-ISIS summit co-hosted by your two countries, as well as massive Saudi investments in America and a large number of officials visiting. Frankly speaking, is the bilateral relationship finally back on track? So let me start by saying that the secretary's visit to the kingdom, much like President Biden's own visit back in July, is a testament to the strength and endurance of the relationship. This is a longstanding relationship that goes back 80 years. During that time, it has continued to strengthen and to broaden and to deepen on multiple levels. If you look at the different meetings that the secretary attended, uh, he obviously met with His Royal Highness, uh, the Crown Prince. He met with His Highness Prince Faisal bin Farhad, the foreign minister, in addition to the de-ISIS meeting and the GCC meeting as well. So if you look at all those different meetings, it really underscores the multidimensional nature of this relationship. There's cooperation and coordination between the two countries on a bilateral level. There's coordination on a regional level. And there's also cooperation and coordination on a multilateral, almost global level. Well, you say there's been cooperation on a number of levels, Mr. Nasser, but many critics have called the past two and a half years as one of the worst periods in Saudi-US relations. Yet one could argue that the animosity came from the administration in its early days. And interestingly, all of the reconciliatory steps that began with the Biden visit last year have also come from that very same administration. So I have to ask, what has the kingdom offered Washington in return? Or would you say that the administration simply had a change of heart? Right. So with all due respect, I don't agree with that characterization. I think the relationship has been on solid ground for many years. During even if you're referring to the past two years, our relationship and cooperation and coordination on multiple fronts has continued. One, our trade between the two countries has continued and has continued to increase, in fact, in recent years, by the U.S. government's own estimates, the trade in goods and services between the two countries, which is valued at $40 billion a year, supports 165,000 American jobs right here in the United States. The military coordination and, and cooperation continues. That includes regular military joint training between our armed services. That has continued nonstop. The visits back and forth are continuing. We still have thousands of students studying in the United States. There's thousands of Americans living in the kingdom. So I, I think it's important to know that in any relationship, you are bound to have a difference of opinion over certain policies. However, that does not, not detract from the fact that when it comes to Saudi Arabia and the United States, in particular, our policies align much more broadly than, uh, than we have differences. Well, you might disagree with that statement, but there has been countless media reports on last year's tense relationship between the two countries. But moving forward, as we mentioned, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken has just concluded a visit to the kingdom. Now, according to an official statement, he discussed the strategic cooperation between the two countries. He also met with GCC officials and co-chaired a meeting of the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS. So, in your opinion, how did this trip go and what were the main wins for the kingdom from his visit? Right. I, I think this was a successful trip in the sense that they really reinforced the pillars of the relationship. Again, much like President Biden's visit back in July. 
Uh, these visits have reinforced that the pillars, which include political cooperation, security cooperation, military cooperation, and trade, at the same time, in many ways, they have also outlined the new contours of a more expanded relationship that does include cooperation on a number of new fronts, including uh, cybersecurity, uh, mitigating the impact of climate change, um, food security, and even space exploration. So this is, like I said, this is a relationship that has not only endured, but has really continued to broaden and to deepen over the years. Well, you say the relationship between both sides has changed for the better. Let's talk about some of what went on during this visit. The official statement I referenced earlier points out to strategic cooperation in terms of both security and economic matters. But if I can ask, since the kingdom has recently signed a peace deal with Iran, with China as the guarantor, and considering these days that China and India are the largest importers of Saudi oil, does the kingdom still need the U.S.'s protection? And in fact, is business with America still a priority for Riyadh? So Saudi Arabia believes that it can maintain good or excellent relations with the overwhelming majority of countries around the region. Our relationship with the United States is longstanding. It is strategic and has not changed. If it has changed, it has changed for the better in the sense that it's gotten broader and deeper and stronger. At the same time, we are cultivating and strengthening relations with countries in the region and beyond. You name China, India, just to name a few. And these relationships are important for us, certainly for economic reasons. However, I think it's very important to keep in mind that as we strengthen relations with new countries in the region or beyond, those relationships are not coming at the expense of our longstanding relations with the United States, the UK, France, or uh, some of these, uh, you know, long lasting or long standing relationships. Well, certainly one of the big deals that recently had a lot of interest was a $37 billion deal to purchase 121 aircrafts from Boeing. Now, interestingly, the White House issued a statement last March. They praised the deal as a milestone in cooperation between the kingdom and American industry. Now, this is quite a big endorsement coming from Washington. Why was this deal important for America and what does Riyadh hope to get out of it? Well, uh, this deal was important. I do believe it was important for both countries. So one of the many goals that Saudi Arabia has as part of Vision 2030 is to transform the kingdom into a global logistics hub, but also a global tourism destination. We believe that we have a lot to offer to uh, tourists and certainly businesses around the world. So one of the ways that we are seeking to accomplish that is to make the country more accessible. So we have actually just uh, launched a brand new airline, new known as uh, Riyadh Air. And we also have the flagship Saudi Airlines. Both of those carriers signed a deal with Boeing that, as you correctly said, is worth $37 billion that will support an additional 110,000 jobs here in the United States. So again, as far as we're concerned, this uh, this was a win-win. And certainly the developments in tourism are important, but this seems to be about more than just buying planes. Uh, Republican Senator Lindsey Graham paid a visit to the kingdom uh, to thank your government for the Boeing deal. Now, he's also done a massive U-turn on some of his previous criticisms. In fact, nowadays he seems to be in favour of an even stronger US-Saudi relationship. So what changed? Right. So I think, and I've seen, I've observed uh, this personally uh, over the past couple of years, people who visit Saudi Arabia, people who have been, let's say, 10 or 20 years ago, or even 10, you know, seven years ago or five years ago, and come back and visit now, cannot help but notice the dramatic changes that have taken place in the kingdom. You see it as soon as you land at the airport in Riyadh or Jeddah. Uh, the most evident change is just how many women are involved in society now, um, whether in the private sector, in the uh, public sector, you have a, a very young population in Saudi Arabia. And these young people are now at the forefront of this amazing transformation. Again, you see them in the public sector, you see them in the private sector. Uh, they're at the forefront of uh, what is arguably the most ambitious and most transformative transformation currently taking place anywhere in the world. And uh, whether it's uh, Senator Graham or others, I've had the pleasure of actually accompanying a number of American delegations over the past couple of years. And again, I hear the same 
feedback from uh, from business leaders, from civil society leaders, think tank leaders. People are literally amazed at how much the country has changed, how it looks different, it feels different, it's certainly opened up. And um, so that's I'm not surprised to hear people come back with a very positive impression, you know, following these visits. So certainly there's been some big changes that have taken place in Saudi. But is it fair to say that your government has managed to convince both Republicans and Democrats of the strategic value of this relationship? Right. So we are not I don't think we're trying to convince any of our partners of the importance of our relationship or the importance of what's happening uh, in the kingdom. I think people who have been following developments in the kingdom, people who know and have been following the important role that Saudi Arabia plays globally on a number of fronts, whether we're talking about stabilizing international energy markets, whether we are talking about countering the threat of extremist and terrorist groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda. And now we're even leading, uh, playing a leading role regionally, certainly, when it comes to climbing, uh, sorry, combating climate change. Um, I think there's a realization, certainly in the United States, that Saudi Arabia is a very important global player. And I think there's also a realization in the U.S. and probably other countries that the bilateral relations have been mutually beneficial to both countries, advancing their national security interests and economic interests of both countries. And this is according, again, this is not my own words, this is according to several uh, administrations going back 50 years. But you have been known to be on good terms with Republicans. Are you now on good terms with both? I am, yeah. I think, like I said, I think the relationship has continued to deepen and to broaden and to strengthen under both Republican and Democratic administrations, absolutely. Well, certainly there's been improving relations between the U.S. and Saudi and indeed other countries such as Iran. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about that Chinese brokered Saudi-Iran deal. There are some analysts who say the U.S. has been taken by surprise from it. So were American officials briefed or informed by your government before the signing on the 10th of March? Right. So we have ongoing conversations with our American partners on a number of fronts. When it comes to Iran specifically, we have said all along and going back several years at this point that Iran is obviously our neighbor. They have a great potential. They have a predominantly young population. They have a great history and culture. And so over the past two years, we've had a number of talks uh, in different places and that culminated in this agreement that was announced in Beijing back in March, where we did announce the restoration of diplomatic relations and opening our embassies. And so, um, but in some ways, I think it's important to note that obviously this is a very positive development, but in some ways it's the beginning of an ongoing conversation with Iran. So because we did reach this agreement, it does not necessarily mean that we have resolved all our differences. We do remain to have some concerns specifically about Iran's nuclear program. So we will continue to uh, discuss these issues with Iran, but also with our partners around the world. But the White House did come out and say that they were brief. So my question is, how much did they know in advance? Well, I, I mean, I can't give you a specific date, but like I said, Saudi Arabia and the United States are the in days, constant communication. Weeks, what, if you can give me a broader term. Yeah, I, I, to be honest, I, I don't think it really matters. But like I said, uh, Saudi Arabia and the United States are in regular uh, talks. So we have a very robust ongoing dialogue on a number of fronts. So we uh, we keep, you know, our partners, whether it's the United States or our regional partners, abreast on uh, a lot of developments because I think to a large extent some of the we have a lot of shared interests and a lot of shared concerns with the United States as well as uh, with some of our regional partners, uh, you know, in the region and uh, and abroad. Well, you said that doesn't matter, but why have so many U.S. critics come out and describe this peace deal as a slap in the face to the U.S.? Isn't achieving regional stability actually in American interests? Yeah, I'm not. Uh, uh, I haven't come across that many accounts. I mean, there's been some criticism, but, uh, you know, the way we see it is we believe we have this amazing transformation uh, currently taking place in the kingdom known as Vision 2030. A lot of the goals of the vision are specifically geared and focused on transforming and diversifying our economy. However, some of the other goals we have, we do have some other goals that requires peace and sp stability in the region uh, and, and even uh, more broadly. So 
like I said, things like transforming the king into a tourism destination, into a logistics hub, um, combating climate change. These are challenges that are in many ways global in nature and uh, require the region to enjoy some peace and, and stability. And so this is what we're doing. And we, through our engagements, whether with Iran or some of our other uh, you know, re, uh, regional partners, but also partners in other regions of the world. We believe that we need peace and prosperity, certainly in the region, to be able to achieve some of the uh, Vision 2030. Okay, goals. sure. So in, in many but, ways, but just to confirm, the Iran-Saudi deal will achieve regional stability, and that can't be against U.S. interests, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we are certainly hopeful that this agreement does represent a new chapter in our relations with Iran, I think that when it comes to uh, overall policies, Saudi, Saudi and U.S. policies, there's a, a great deal of alignment on some of the major challenges. So just to give an example, Saudi Arabia and the United States have been working very closely on trying to advance or help restore peace and stability in Sudan. We are both facilitators of some of the talks that have been taking place that have allowed some of the humanitarian aid to be delivered to Sudan and have decreased tensions uh, a little bit. So we believe that these are steps in the right direction. Going back years, we've both been working very closely to try to restore peace and stability uh, to Yemen. We are working on a number of fronts where, again, we have broad alignment on some of these most uh, pressing issues. And certainly, I think there's also alignment and some of the concerns that we have had in the past about Iran and some of its policies in the region. And you're right, we are seeing more stability in the region. In fact, picking up on what you said about Yemen, one of the byproducts of the Saudi-Iran deal is the de-escalation that we are seeing in Yemen. Has the US offered to help in any way to mediate between the warring factions there? Yeah, the US has been pretty involved in, uh, in Yemen, but so has Saudi Arabia. So really Saudi Arabia, has done everything it can to try to restore peace and stability. It has been working on multiple fronts in Yemen. It is the top provider of humanitarian assistance. As of last count, we have provided $17 billion of assistance. This has been in the form of shipments of uh, food and medicine and support to internally displaced people. We've even begun supporting some projects to help uh, Yemen recover from the war. We've helped build hospitals and schools and uh, power plants, uh, water treatment plants, again, to try to help Yemen move along uh, to recover from this, uh, you know, this this longstanding conflict. But we've been working very closely with the United States and with the United Nations as well. We've been very supportive of the UN envoys efforts to try to broker and promote a political resolution, because ultimately this is this is where we feel the, the ultimate solution is, is through a, an inclusive political dialogue that does resolve all the differences between the different parties in Yemen. Well, I ask that, Mr. Naza, because there have been several media reports, including the US based The Intercept, that have accused Washington of deliberately dragging its feet when it comes to helping find a political solution in Yemen. In fact, even the US envoy, Tim Lindekin, in his recent statements, he didn't seem very enthusiastic. So, can I ask, are you getting enough support from the US to help mediate between the warring factions in Yemen or not? So we are working with the United States as well as with other partners in the region and uh, and some of our European partners are very much involved in trying to mediate and uh, advance a political resolution to the conflict in Yemen. Uh, we are certainly engaged with all the relevant parties there. We are encouraged certainly by the fact that there's been a a dramatic decrease in the violence in Yemen going back over the past a year or so. This is largely due to the uh, uh, truce that we have, uh, certainly we're observing, and we have been for a, a number of months. This has, like I said, has made a huge difference in reducing the, uh, the tensions and the violence in the country. We're continue, continuing to provide humanitarian assistance at the same time. And we are encouraged by the formation or the establishment of the Presidential Leadership Council, which does represent the various segments uh, in Yemen. We believe that that's a step in the right direction. Sure, but is the US doing enough? Is there anything that you wish they could do more of? So the crisis in Yemen, the conflict in Yemen began when the Houthis took up arms against internationally recognized government of Yemen. 
and it will end when the Houthis uh, put down their weapons and go back to the negotiating table. And uh, and we believe that there's been progress along those lines. So ultimately, this is a Yemeni conflict, and it is up to the relevant parties in Yemen to uh, to come to an agreement and to uh, resolve it. So I don't think it's fair to try to blame the United States or Saudi Arabia or to expect the kingdom or any other country to impose their will or uh, to to resolve some of these longstanding crises. These are complicated uh, conflicts. We are certainly Saudi Arabia is doing everything it can to uh, advance a political resolution there. But ultimately, we cannot impose a solution on uh, the people of Yemen. Well, one area of clear cooperation between the U.S. and Saudi has been trying to reduce tensions in Sudan. You mentioned that briefly earlier. So what is the latest on that front and what can we realistically expect? Right. So Saudi Arabia has been engaged in Sudan from the beginning of the crisis. We are engaged with all the relevant relevant parties. We have asked for a, uh, a stop to all acts of violence. We have called for calm. We have called for self-restraint. Saudi Arabia played the leading role in evacuating thousands of foreign nationals uh, from Sudan. We evacuated 8,500 uh, people from Sudan, most of whom, in fact, were not Saudi, but foreign nationals coming from 100 different countries. We also played an important supporting role in helping other countries evacuate an additional 15,000 or so um, foreign nationals from Sudan. In addition, as I, as I said, we, we have also, we are beginning and we've provided $100 million worth of humanitarian assistance to Sudan as of last count. I believe we've sent six or seven plane loads of critical assistance, uh, food and medicine and other critical supplies to the people of Sudan. And just as importantly, we've obviously hosted both parties in Jeddah, We've where they've been able to reach some uh, short-term agreements that have allowed the humanitarian aid to uh, reach people who need it. It has led to a decrease in some of the violence. In fact, there was just another short-term agreement on a truce that was just signed today. We believe that these are steps in the right direction that will hopefully lead to continuation of talks and for confidence to increase between the two parties. But again, ultimately, these the relevant parties in Sudan have to put the, the interest of the people of Sudan above all else and to come to an agreement and realize that uh, there's no military solution to this crisis and that the only way to resolve it is through uh, political negotiations. And we are seeing some progress on that front, particularly with the US-Saudi collaboration. But one contentious issue for the US has been the readmission of Syria into the Arab League. Now, an Arabic spokesperson for the US State Department uh, recently told regional media that Washington opposes normalizing ties with the Syrian regime, which it says use chemical weapons against their own people. How far do you think the disagreement with Washington can go on this topic? Right. So our leadership has concluded correctly that the uh, status quo was simply not sustainable. So the efforts to isolate Syria and the Syrian government indefinitely were not helping stabilize Syria. They were certainly not helping in terms of allowing the provision and the, the delivery of humanitarian assistance. And they certainly were not helping return the millions of people who were, have been displaced and who are now refugees in other countries return to Syria. What we are seeking to promote is a political resolution to the uh, conflict there that preserves Syria's independence, that preserves its territorial integrity and unity and allows uh, people who have been displaced to return the, to their homes safely and also to allow the delivery of badly needed humanitarian assistance to reach the people who need it most. Let's talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Now, Riyadh has always maintained that any normalization with Israel must first involve a just solution for the Palestinian people. But prior to his arrival to the kingdom, Secretary Blinken spoke very enthusiastically about having a US role in Saudi-Israeli normalization. Now, recent media reports have suggested that the kingdom have given the US several additional conditions before agreeing to move forward. So my question is, has there been any change in the kingdom's position towards normalization with Israel in recent months? 
So Saudi Arabia's position on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has been clear and has been consistent for many years. In fact, it was the late King Abdullah who, way back in 2002, introduced what is now known as the Arab Peace Initiative at the Arab League Summit in Beirut in that year. And the proposal, the initiative, does offer Israel uh, normalization with all members of the Arab states in return for a just and comprehensive peace with the Palestinians based on a two-state solution. That offer really still remains on the table, and we're certainly hopeful that the Israelis and Palestinians do go back to the negotiating table to try to resolve this core dispute once and for all, which has obviously brought, not only brought much pain and suffering uh, across the region, but it's also been exploited by some of the most extreme elements in the region, whether it's ISIS, Al-Qaeda, or Hezbollah. These terrorist groups have paid lip service to this conflict for years and have used it to recruit followers and to raise funds. So if it is resolved, uh, we, there's, we have no illusions about the fact that, again, Israel has a lot of potential and normalization can really do wonders, not just for Israelis and Palestinians, but there's great potential for, for trade and uh, cultural exchanges and exchanges with Israel on multiple fronts. But for that to happen, for the kingdom to take that step, we really do need that core dispute to be resolved. So no major shift in the kingdom's position and certainly some big changes that are still needed for the Palestinian people. Well, last but not least, an area of US-Saudi cooperation has recently been space exploration. Now, first of all, congratulations on the success of the Saudi mission and, of course, the safe return of your two astronauts, including Rihanna Banawi. Now, she's the first ever female Arab astronaut in space. Secondly, how does this fit into the context of the Saudi-US relationship, given that this was a private mission? Right. This was a very proud moment for us. So as part of Vision 2030, we really believe that uh, technology, science and innovation hold the keys to addressing some of the main challenges that we as an international community face. Space exploration has always been at the forefront of scientific uh, advancement and, and discovery and uh, so it's very consistent. It's very much consistent with what we're doing with Vision 2030. As you correctly said, the astronauts that we sent that uh, did include the first Saudi woman uh, to ever go to space. What did they spend the bulk of their their time? In fact, conducting scientific experiments. Uh, Vayana is in fact a scientist by training. She conducted 14 different experiments um, dealing with uh, the the immune system, with the nervous system, with the brain. Um, so this was a very proud moment for us. And in some ways, this was a different experience. It was almost an immersive experience for the rest of the kingdom because the astronauts, uh, Ali Al-Qarni is, is the male astronaut, by the way, were able to share much of their experience with people back in the kingdom. So they had a couple of chats with students where they conducted some basic uh, experiments with students in Saudi schools. They showed people how they where they slept, what they ate. So it was a very exciting and a very proud moment for us. Well, certainly an incredible moment for Saudi Arabia and a major milestone for Saudi's space exploration. Mr. Nazar, thank you for joining us today on Frankly Speaking. We appreciate your time. It's been my pleasure. Thank you.